Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our ESCI webinar on human factors in rail, people and technology. My name is Lutz Hübner from the cluster Transport, Mobility and Logistics in the German capital region, Berlin Brandenburg. I will lead you uh, through this webinar. And uh, traditionally, we starting uh, first uh, to have a short introduction on what ERCI is. ERCI is a European Railway Clusters Initiative founded in 2010. Now it's a legal entity uh, based in Brussels. We have 18 uh, cluster members from uh, which are covering 17 European countries. And uh, you will see on the map uh, which countries are, are covered. Uh, and uh, there are not only countries from the European Union, uh, but also from outside uh, uh, the EU. And uh, ESCI represents over 3,600 organizations, uh, of which uh, the majority is small and medium-sized enterprises. So, uh, yeah, what about uh, our services? Uh, it's all about bringing customers, suppliers, and supply chain opportunities together, especially for small, medium-sized enterprises. We uh, want to uh, enhance uh, the, their visibility on European level through uh, several instruments, uh, for instance, to partner matchmaking in R&D projects, to uh, 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 explore new uh, markets uh, uh, outside their own country and outside the EU uh, to discuss with them uh, innovation topics uh, which will have a major influence on the future railway system like cyber secu security, multimodal logistics, uh, green and sustainable mobility and human factors. And uh, I mark this in red uh, because that is the topic of uh, the today's webinar. And for sure, enhancing the visibility is also due to bilateral web workshops, webinars, uh, uh, where uh, companies have the chance to introduce uh, to the audience uh, new innovative uh, solutions, products, developments. Yeah, the contact data you will find uh, on this slide. Uh, yeah, ESCI is the European Railway Meter Cluster. It is unique uh, in Europe, and uh, yeah, the contact data uh, will be visible uh, also uh, into the chat. Uh, uh, in the chat, uh, we know it's so uh, smart uh, and uh, copy and paste uh, all the hyperlinks uh, uh, that occur in this uh, session uh, also into the chat. And the chat has another uh, important function. It is good to for your questions. Please, if you have questions uh, regarding uh, the two presentations, please uh, put these questions into the chat. Coming uh, to the first one, and the first one is uh, human factors in transportation and construct uh, with many facets. And uh, the presenter is uh, Astrid Oehmer uh, from, uh, from Human Factors Consult uh, uh, located uh, in Berlin. And uh, yes, uh, what uh, to say uh, something? Oh, sorry. <laughs> what to say something about uh, uh, about Astrid? Uh, uh, Astrid uh, holds a degree in psychology with a focus on human technology interaction and human factors. She has been working at HFC as project manager and human factors consultant since 2003, and has been managing the company since 2015. Her work focuses on user research in various application spaces, especially in uh, transportation and mobility, where she has been uh, managing various national and European projects. Astrid's presentation provides an insight into the multifaceted research field of human factors in transportation. For the Q&A session, she is particularly interested in the challenges you are facing in the railway sector. And that's the question, which challenges uh, are you facing in the railway sector regarding human factors? Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Lutz, um, and for the invite to take part in this webinar today. So um, I'm going to share my slides. I hope it works. Oops. We'll jump in, I guess. Yes. Yeah. As well. 
<laughs> we will find a quick solution. <laughs> we will find a quick solution, hopefully. Yeah. So. It's shared? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's go through this. <laughs> so uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on human factors. Um, my um, presentation will be going on uh, going about human factors and transportation, a construct with uh, many facets. Um, just a short introduction um, of who we are. Um, so human factors consult. Um, is a private research institute, a small and medium-sized um, research institute, um, which was founded in 2002. Um, right now, we are about 16 colleagues from humanities and engineering, and um, we deal with adapting hard and software to human needs and human requirements. So uh, we try to um, um, support a consortia and um, tech um, uh, tech um, enterprises in order to shape their products in a way that they're usable by humans and they um, adapt to their needs. And so we specialize in the conception, design and evaluation of technical systems and software interfaces for a high usability, acceptance and safety. And what we bring in, I mean, I've, I've been in the company for 20 years, so we are in the field uh, for more than 20 years now, and uh, we bring in um, high um, competencies from different uh, methodologies. Uh, we work interdisciplinary um, and we collaborate with our customers and consorts, yeah and um, support innovative solutions. Um, so what does interdisciplinary mean? Um, we are basically um, engineers and psychologists, um, human factor specialists and IT specialists, and we are all um, trying to solve uh, problems of technology, um, human adaptation. So adapting humans to take uh, to, uh, technology to humans and we do that in very various sectors uh, a lot of that um, in mobility so you have um, aviation automotive um, but also railway sector um, and I brought some examples of our work with me um, from all of those areas um, but we also take a look into safety medical and human robotic interaction so um, why human factors? Um, I would assume that um, there is a very heterogeneous group here um, in the seminar um, in terms of um, relating to human factors. Um, what would you think um, human factors are all about? So if one or two want to try to put it in the chat. Um, maybe um, Lutz can throw in um, the answers. What do you think are human factors? Going to answer that. The obvious um, audience is too shy to put something they into are too the chat shy for the oh my god okay um <laughs> that's okay <laughs> that's okay i brought with me a, a small definition um so human factors are concerned with the application of what we know about people basically their abilities their characteristics and nations to the design of equipment they use um the environment in which they function and the jobs they perform this is one of the definitions of the human factors in ergonomics society. Um, so it's if you take a look at the at this um, definition, it's all about actually it's all about people and it's all about psychology basically, and the interaction with systems, so with technology. Um, so how did human factors um, or how yeah did human factors get invented basically um 
Well, there were um, early works on exp uh, and experiences from manned systems and aircraft crashes, basically. So, um, in former times, um, during the First World War, um, the the credo was to adapt humans to the de technology. The technology was new, and humans had to um, basically adapt to that. Um, but um, sooner or later, with a lot of, um, especially aircraft crashes, um, it was realized that um, the technology um, development was so fast that humans couldn't adapt, especially to a very bad design, a very bad interface design. Um, so um, human factors um, was basically created uh, in that human um, abilities and their characteristics were taken into consideration a bit more. And today, um, human factors are considering basically all incidents, either a series or benign, um, so not, not only aircraft crashes. Um, and also, they um, are considered in advance, so before developing systems, human factors are taken into account, at least if everything goes well. In, in the product development, and you think about the human who is going to use uh, the technology. Um, so um, our topics and services um, float basically around this user-centered uh, engineering process, uh, which is also um, built into a, um, a D norm. Um, you usually um, start with a vision. And then um, you have to define user requirements in order to get your vision into a product that users can actually um, apply. Um, so typical uh, user research um, uh, questions, typical um, topics would be workload and stress and fatigue. So how stressed is a user going to be uh, when using a certain system? And how much workload does it put on him? Uh, will he be, he or she will be um, fatigued um, using the system? It's about attention allocation and situation awareness, about the usability of the system and the user experience. Uh, the user is then um, uh, experience basically, and also how the system um, will um, shape the decision making and the actions of the user. So um, what you would have here um, basically is um, you go from the vision to the user research. Um, you try to take into account as much as you know um, about uh, the human user to develop user interfaces. And once you have the started to develop the user interfaces, you frequently test and adapt these user interfaces um, to the needs of the user. So this is a cycle which um, basically goes on until you're satisfied with the product and uh, it is working well for the user. Um, so um, the outcomes of our work um, often are frameworks and uh, taxonomies, and especially in terms of user research, so the, um, taxonomies um, about um, how the product could be used, um, but also about the user requirements, um, which kind of user groups are there, and which kind of stakeholder groups, um, but also frameworks in terms of how does this whole interaction work and are there other um, facilitators or um, other um, influences that could um, um, impact this use. Um, then we have system and workplace, um, but also a procedure design, which could be an outcome. Um, of course, um, this is all about the engineering process. Um, so you want to design a system, basically. Sometimes it's a whole workplace, like in, um, for instance, in control rooms. Um, and sometimes it also applies to a new procedure. So you have a new system, you have to adapt your procedure to that. Um, and you have to introduce a new procedure which fits to your workflow and the tasks you're doing. 
Um, sometimes the outcomes are also approaches and methods. Um, so um, not everything is standardized out there in user research. You have a lot of uh, good tools, a lot of good um, techniques, um, in, for instance, in terms of um, measuring situational awareness. Um, but oftentimes you also have to develop a new questionnaire, for instance, for a certain construct uh, or a new uh, kind of procedure. So um, in, in terms of the method um, that we're using to test. So um, approaches and methods um, in testing and adapting could be also an outcome. Um, formal evaluation. So after all this evaluation, um, maybe on the functions, but eventually also on the on uh, summative uh, testing, so on the whole system, you will have a fair um, uh, knowledge about whether a system, for instance, is working safely. So you have the formal evaluations. You can do that in the lab or in simulation or the field. And um, you um, have also the outcome of tools for operation and training uh, sometimes, um, so um, expert-based um input that you you can collect um, from multiple usage of a system um, and you can then of course feed that into the training of um, um, of a workplace um, and new tasks for instance so these would be outcomes of our work and last but not least if you take the broader perspective of that um well if you deal with human factors and you do frequent use of research in human factors, um, you have a good understanding of what a good usability is, what a good user experience should be, um, how you can facilitate, for instance, situation awareness, but also all the factors that would influence um, uh, basically um, your performance within a certain setting. And um, therefore, all this information can um, be brought into uh, human factors trainings, uh, which sometimes is uh, in the transportation sector, sometimes is also mandatory, um, for instance, in aviation for suppliers to require uh, or yeah, to, to hold up um, everything. Um, that would be one part that we're dealing with as well. So human factors trainings, um, a lot of psychology is included there. Um, in terms of perception, in terms of um, processing, um, information processing, but also in terms of the factors influencing your performance. And the other broader perspective um, would be a change management. So um, if you have a new system, not, not always everybody is happy about that. If this is introduced into a work, uh, workplace, for instance, um, in, or, and in order to um, facilitate um, the adoption of the new technology and also the acceptance, it is vital and mandatory that you think about your change management, about how to communicate an introduction of a new product, and also in um, making sure that the uh, users um, that will deal with the new technology are already participating in its development. So this is uh, a change management approach uh, which is um, participatory and um, should be taken in a, into account as well. So the broader perspective would be also change management. Okay. Um, so when we talk about human factors in transportation, we have um, a few um, active parts here um, in terms of the human, and um, this would be, at least for um, for the um, narrow, more narrow perspective, the controller, the operator, which of course work or might work for a service provider, and you have on the other hand the passenger who receives uh, the services um, by the service provider. And all of those um, are interlinked. All of these actors are interlinked, of course. So um, I will take the um, 
a look now into these three perspectives of the three actors in uh, the system transportation um, and what we can do for them in terms of human factors, what could be issues in terms of human factors um, for these um, three um, groups. So um, if you take the controller perspective, um, what we deal with are, is many forms. So um, there are um, a lot of topics to address. For instance, assessing the efficiency and the psychological impact of introducing no, new IT technologies for the sake of improving controller operator interaction. So um, usually you should be able to interact, um, so operators and controllers uh, should be able to interact um, during um, operations and um, yeah, not, not so long ago, uh, new IT technologies were introduced to uh, facilitate that. And um, of course, when new technologies are introduced, they can be many fold. Um, you have to test also if they are efficient and also if they have any impact um, on the workload, for instance, of controllers and operators. Um, also, um, we also took a look into um, the improvement of traffic supervision and situation awareness of traffic controllers based on traffic predictions. Um, sometimes you want to optimize the use of human resources and increase safety. Um, so we take a look into that in uh, multi-air traffic control. And um, last but not least, um, of course, you want to reduce stress and the amount of decision making during incident recovery by providing something to the user or to the controller in that case. Um, and we um, developed something to recommend um, a framework and procedural tools for that. And um, we now take a quick look into different and um, projects because um, I think it's it's more um, it, it's less abstract to have a look into a project uh, in in order to see what we or what our perspective on human factors is and how broad the const, uh, construct is actually. So if you look into the controller side um, and the advanced mobile ICT in control rooms. Um, we had, or um, we had a project um, for the German Federal Institute of C Occupational Safety and Health, um, BAWA, in which we um, tried to find out whether new and novel ICT uh, would support the processes for um, the controllers and also the people inspecting in the field, which is maybe um, more related to energy uh, and other control rooms, but also for the transportation system. So in this project, stress and strain in control rooms and field work was analyzed when using novel and mobile ICT. Um, so using tablets, for instance, using smartphones um, when going into the field and um, collecting data and sending data, for instance, um, to uh, the control room. Um, we um, investigated this uh, very thoroughly. Um, we did uh, on-site uh, observations and interviews, and subsequently um, um, we um, made a catalog um, for design recommendations and measures for task and work on the organization when using this advanced ICT. Um, so, um, a very comprehensive catalog, how to um, integrate human factors, how to um, make the systems for communication between um, a control room and on-site um, usable and um, more um, supporting, supporting the work. Um, and the tasks of the operators and of the inspectors on site. So the research emphasis was on usefulness and usability of novel work equipment and its acceptance by control.
from the field workers. So this is one aspect of uh, human factors. You do human factors analysis when you already have new technology in the field, because um, sometimes you're not um, in the process of developing this new um, technology and you cannot support in that, but of course you can evaluate and then draw conclusions if this is in the field for some time and give recommendations of how to do it, maybe exactly the same way or a bit better. In the realm of um, transportation, um, we did a project together with um, many partners. It was a funded giant pro a research project called Autocar. And um, here it was quite different. Um, it was a new um, system that um, was developed um, for traffic control, actually, for um, traffic control room operators. Um, they received a virtual traffic presentation, which provided a hitherto unavailable overview of the current um, overall situation in a traffic tunnel. Um, so it was equipped with a traffic prediction and it helped to um, find out whether there would be, for instance, um, congestions or other difficult situations. So whether it was likely that incidents would occur, for instance, and um, we did a requirements analysis there with the tunnel operators, um, developed a GUI um, for this um, prediction for, for this um, um, yeah, overview, traffic present, representation overview. Um, and um, we evaluated, of course, afterwards we evaluated the tool. So this was um, for the scratch um, um, development and um, we supported basically the whole development process in that. Um, so human factors here um, throughout the whole uh, engineering UCD process. Uh, ongoing work here um, in this project um, is an in-house um, product development. Um, it's called Masterman and it's an assistance system for air traffic controllers um, who are operating in multi-airport control. So um, that means one air traffic controller controls more than one airport at a time um, and um, might even control um, yeah, several flights at a time, um, but all this according um, to uh, the actual workload. And in order to have a good distribution um, based on the actual workload, for instance, um, and to make the planning and support um, the, the overall staff planning, uh, we developed an assistance system, which is still uh, st still going on. And it provides an optimized management of human resources and a more balanced workload um, during operations, because there could be in, in an air traffic management situation, there could be an overload, of course, but there could be also um, an underload um, if you have to control an airport uh, where nothing really is happening, where there are just a few flights um, during the day. So in order to balance that, uh, and this uh, assistance system is supporting. So um, eventually, um, with a more balanced workload, of course, you have an increased overall safety. And last but not least, um, the controller. Um, in the field of disposition um, for rail-based local transport systems um, in a funded joint research project, we looked into new technologies uh, that enable energy optimized braking, acceleration and startup processes while adhering to the timetable. So it's a very, um, very novel um, way of looking at that, um, of course, to be energy optimized. It's on vogue right now, but uh, this is a project which um, has been finished already. So um, never mind the um, the interfaces; they would look 
much nicer now. <laughs> but um, yeah, we were probably a bit ahead of time uh, during that project. Um, so to achieve this goal, all the information, the vehicle's energy requirements, and the available traffic data from the control center was automatically collected and processed into real time driving rec recommendations. And um, we um, developed the interface of a central system component for the control center, for the dispatcher. And it um, assisted with incident management, basically. So um, it provided a procedure to uh, go through an incident and um, provided uh, next steps to do, like um, the classification of the incident, like the localization where the incident happened, recommendations for um, resolvement, and also the Im expected impact this resolvement would have on energy saving um, and also the, the overall outcome. And um, we gave um, me measures or um, recommendations for the service and the communication um, when um, dealing with, with an incident. So um, that would be the controller. It's, it's quite, um, so human factors manifold um, um, already here uh, for the controller side. Um, you have the development of various um, various um, assistance systems, for instance, but also a bit the procedures, of course, here in this case, also the procedures and um, the, the steps to be taken. You give re recommendations and you also, um, of course, test your, um, your prototypes. If we take a look at the operator, so the driver, for instance, um, the train driver, uh, the truck driver, the driver as such um, on the operator side, um, you might um, have questions of evaluating the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness safety and overall psychological impact um, when you perform a new procedure, actually. Um, or to improve um, situation awareness for the sake of um, safety um, of vulnerable road users. You can also facilitate energy saving during train operations by rec giving recommendations or provide communication assistance. So if we take a look into um, this field, um, of course, the assistance systems are not um, uh, that broad anymore. They are more tailored to one user, and this would be the operator, usually the driver. Um, very direct um, assistance um, for that. So um, in that case, um, just an overview of a few projects like uh, turning assistance for uh, assistant for truck with a 3D LiDAR sensors, also a, a joint research project um, which deals with um, these dangerous turning accidents between large vehicles and typically cyclists. And um, again, here we followed a user-centered approach. Uh, we derived the requirements and we did, we had a very long testing phase on that one. So we incorporated all um, what we observed in traffic uh, observation surveys of truck drivers and cyclists into an HMI. And we iteratively, iteratively um, validated the system over a three year development process. Um, as a result, we have now a prototype assistance system available that enables the detection of cyclists and can give predictions of critical situations and communicate that in meaningful warning strategies. So human factor would be here again, and have a assistance system adapted to the needs of a certain operator. Um, but sometimes you also um, again have the procedure, um, in that case, um, a new um, procedure of a landing phase. 
Um, and this was more like a formal uh, human factors evaluation. Um, so um, you have, if you land um, when you are airborne, if you land, um, you have a different or you can have different thresholds to land an aircraft. And in that case, um, dual threshold um, operations were tested. They are um, depicted uh, in the upper right picture. And um, this might, one never knows, this might be very stressful um, for a pilot. And before trying that out um, in the field, in the real, it would be good to test that in a simulator and to really have a thorough evaluation of that. So this is what we um, were, um, we were given this task to do this um, formal evaluation. And um, we determined that via psychophysiological measures. So sometimes the measurement uh, um, we are taking in order to find out if there is any impact on the human, it could be just surveys um, or inspection methods, but also uh, the, it could be also the measurement of psychophysiological data, for instance. So we try to find out how stressful that is right from the body um, body's um, feedback. Um, we also measured situation awareness and workload, um, and we analyzed the attention allocation. This is also a very body-related um, measure, and so what you see here on the you know, right um, is a, a, a bit of an older eye-tracking system. Um, so this whole test took part in a simulator and provided input in whether these um, dual threshold operations um, would be uh, feasible or not. And again, in terms um, of the railway sector, um, you have learned about um, the energy saving project already um, with a view on the um, dispatcher and um, the recommendations for the dispatcher. Um, but also in, in terms of energy saving, uh, the driver um, plays an important role. Um, and um, in this project, there should there was also a development of an assistance system um, for the driver in order to help um, with the braking and acceleration in a way that was really energy optimized. So um, we also dealt with the specifications um, of the railway drivers um, on standard operating functions, and we designed a human interface for the driver as well. So this mobile component, um, um, what you see here on the right side, um, it was um, also to communicate on the one hand um, incidents, basically technical malfunctions, but it also provided with another um, kind of interface information and when to break, for instance. It was tested in our own simulator and subsequently installed into vehicles in order to have a field test. And it primarily supported the drivers in implementing this energy saving driving style. And so using the energy um, that you have to get into the next station without accelerating again basically when not to accelerate anymore. So that was the operator. And last but not least, um, of course, the passenger. Uh, what the services are all about is to move passengers, of course. And here, um, safety, but also comfort and user experience play a vital role. Um, and a vital role is accessibility for mobility services in public transport. Um, so this is um, what we um, also deal regularly with um, in terms of the passenger. Who is this for? So for whom do we um, develop that or give recommendations? So accessibility is made for people with different abilities. All people have their own individual abilities and some have temporary limitations. Some people have one or more disabilities. 
that are permanent maybe and um, these can be con congenial or um, they could be also acquired in the course of life. So they could be permanent, they could be light, uh, time limited, and they could be also situational because you're carrying heavy um, luggage, for instance, or um, you're carrying a bike with you. So not every limitation is also visible. Um, and this is what we try to take into consideration um, when we give consultancy or evaluation services um, to transportation service providers. Um, who are these um, people, the passengers we're doing this for? People, um, there, there's this term people with um, reduced um, mobility. It's um, in the European leg legislation. And it's not um, only disabilities, um, as I mentioned already. It's also if you um, are carrying um, heavy um, luggage with you, if you are on vacation and you don't understand the language um, of the country you are in, or if you otherwise new to, to a country, if you move there, um, various reasons why you could have a reduced mobility at a certain point. And these people have to ta uh, be taken into consideration or all the needs um, of these people. So um, what you can do is to um, assess and um, play with the ergonomics um, of the system. So uh, in transportation, it would be a uh, sink of priority seats, wheelchair space, think of the lighting, the corridor, and how you um, basically do the color schemes um, the sanitary situation, how to access, uh, have the access to the vehicle, to get in and out of the terminal, of course, um, and what you do in terms of breakdowns, incidents, and accidents, how, to, how you get your passengers out of your transport system. This would be access and ergonomics, which play a role in human factors. Um, so. And also on the right hand side, you have the information and communication. So information and communication should be perceivable, understandable, operable, and also robust. These uh, would be mandatory dimensions from the web content accessibility guidelines, which, um, which should apply in, in systems um, for interacting with people. So, so you have the service vehicle infrastructure, you know, with the information system, you have the communication with the staff, but also um, the training of the staff. You have your website where you get the information on your itinerary. You have the planning and ticketing, um, general information about the trip, but also accessibility information. Where can I, is there a lift, for instance? Um, how can I access uh, the vehicle? Um, is there a mobility service around? Uh, questions like that. Um, and for the terminal and gate, of course, uh, the general information, the wayfinding, which should be multifaceted, um, and so on. So this is uh, things to take into consideration to build basically an accessible um, system for, um, for public transport. And um, last but not least, um, to look into that, um, you need to think about many things, of course, um, but uh, it in the end helps your passengers a lot um, and you can provide assess uh, mobility services that are really accessible. Um, on the top of there um, is the two senses principle, of course, to address more than one sense uh, when you're providing information. Um, the height of the people, the co and and things to hold on to, um, the coloring, um, use easy language, uh, use pictures and symbols, um, provide more than one language, use QR codes, um, involve the ticketing also in accessibility, um, in an accessible
the, the tour guidance, the planning, and so on. So these are uh, things you have to keep in mind um, in order to make um, the experience for your passengers as well as possible in terms of accessibility. And um, in that case, what you have in the middle here, um, um, we were um, honored to, to help um, the Verkehrsforum um, Berlin Brandenburg uh, with their mobility services and um, this um, um, app here that you see, the Easy app, um, was nominated for the Deutsche Mobilitätspreis. Um, so that was one of the projects we did as well. Okay, so this um, was quite a um, broad perspective on human factors, I think, uh, for at least the main users um, in this field, which uh, who would be the controllers, the operators, and the passengers. And my question now, again, uh, is in the introduction by Lutz, is uh, so what are your topics? Um, what is something that you have in mind when you think about human factors in the railway? Um, what are your challenges, for instance? And I'd be happy to um, see that then in the discussion. Uh, and for more information, so for references for our partners in, in the joint projects, for instance, and for our contact information, you will find everything on our webpage. Um, thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to receive any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Astrid, for this uh, huge e explanation uh, on the human factors topic in transportation. Uh, by the way, uh, if you are visiting the Innotrans, you will testing the VBB uh, 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 services, uh, and maybe uh, you can also use uh, uh, the app uh, and uh, uh, us, get a self experience uh, in it. So we have prepared some questions uh, 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 coming uh, from the chat and uh, for sure you are uh, free to uh, indicate some more questions into the chat. You are also free to answer uh, this uh, question uh, which is here in a red uh, letters mark. The challenges are you facing in the railway sector regarding human factors? And if the Q&A session is finished, for sure you still have the opportunity to type your ideas uh, into the chat. Coming to the first question, how do you address human factors in in the, uh, in the evaluation processes, Astrid. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, um, yeah, I elaborated on that a bit uh, already. So um, we we take this. Um, usually, we take this um, engineering process, um, human factors, um, user centered design process, uh, basically, and uh, we try to address that already in the user research. Um, so. Um, we try to um, talk with the people, of course, um, to, uh, and try to talk with them about what they expect from the system, what their wishes would be, um, and um, then um, go about the um, system development. So these uh, human factors are addressed basically in the whole um, development process and Oops. in evaluation. All right. Uh, second question: What are the human factors challenges of automation and railway? Yes. Um, yeah. Of course, you have to find a balance here between um, keeping, for instance, a controller or driver in the loop uh, on the other, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, to not overload uh, her or him uh, with information. So this is a big challenge what to communicate and what not to communicate and the training of course so in incidents occur that um, the operator is still in the training and knows what to do yeah there's this third one uh, what uh, you are referring to safety for the railway environment are you using Senelec uh, uh, norms uh, for the safety integrity level which is the uh, safety interest integrity level of a human being. What is your answer on that question? 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I I would not. The last one I cannot <laughs> answer, of course. <laughs> um, yes. Um, for for each um, of these sectors, um, uh, of course, we look into um, the um, respective norms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, a uh, practical question coming uh, uh, from one of the yes. uh, uh, audience. Uh, you have presented a QR code to the German version uh, of your website. Is there an English one available? Yes, maybe next week. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so we, you... we just restructured the page, so um, there will be one available very soon. Sorry yeah, about that. that... That means yeah. you have to be uh, 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 a bit patient uh, and uh, uh, overlook the situation. And uh, 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 then uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, version will be also uh, available. There is another question coming from the chat. How do you measure traffic controllers workload in fatigue and what aspects of their environment do you consider? Yeah. Um, so yes, um, good question. It's it's a very it's very not so easy to answer. <laughs> it depends a bit on the task. Um, so workload and fatigue um, can be measured um, by a psychophysiological data, um, as in the example. So uh, you basically um, um, see how they feel um, in terms of. Um, physical um, um, outcome, um, but also situation aware in terms of situational awareness, um, you would look um, into how they have a, an understanding uh, how a situation will unfold um, or what was um, important information from the past that they have to keep in mind. So there are different methods to do that. Um, also, eye tracking helps a lot um, to see whether there is a high workload or a fatigue. And um, yeah, the, the objective measures so would be, for instance, number of trains uh, to control simultaneously the weather, just like you put in here. So every um, piece of information we can get, which is objective. So I mark the next question as uh, the last question because we are running uh, out of time a bit. Are there any studies regarding interactive guidance inside the vehicle using, for example, the interactive lighting uh, LEDs or connected device in addition to required pictograms and contrasting elements de described in uh, several norms, TSI European norms? I would think so that there is a lot of research on that. Um, yes, um, I think um, if if you wish to um, just contact me, um, get in get in touch with me directly, and um, I will um, address these questions in more detail. Or we could just have a chat um, and a video conference on that. All right, and therefore it would be good uh, that you as uh, they put a uh, quick, uh, quick contact uh, your email address into the chat. Uh, for sure, we will provide uh, uh, the email addresses of both presenters uh, also afterwards in our follow up email uh, together with the two presentations and the, the link uh, to the recording of that webinar. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, you have not been answered uh, all uh, the question of Astrid, which challenges are you facing in the railway sector regarding human factors? Uh, you still have the chance to type in uh, some into the chat uh, and hopefully uh, it works. Uh, in the meanwhile, I will uh, give uh, the floor to uh, my colleague uh, Amelie from eTools. Uh, she will introduce you the second uh, presentation. Hello everybody, I am Amélie Esperou from iTrans, the French competitiveness cluster in the railway uh, industry. We are, uh, of course, ERCI member, and I'm very happy to today to introduce you the next presentation that will be made by Rylenium, a member of iTrans. So what is Rylenium? It's the French Institute for Technological Research dedicated to the railway sector. It supports the actors of the railway industry in the development of their innovations. 
So research activities are organized into different domains. We have human behaviors, railway safety, artificial intelligence, energy, assets management. So the next presentation will be done by uh, Yana Carli. Yana is an engineer working in the field of ergonomics and human factors. She started her career at Relenium in 2022, where she got the opportunity to work on a wide range of rail projects, integrating HOF and ergonomics in a variety of ways, mainly human reliability and user safety. So Yana is going to give you an overview of human factors in railway. Yana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amelie. So I will now share my screen. Yes. Yes. So today I will present an overview of the integration of human factors in railway. So I was going to say a few words about Relenium, but you already done so, Amelie. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in, indeed, Relenium is a French institute for technological research, uh, which is dedicated to the railway. It was founded in 2012 and is based in the north of France, in Valenciennes, but we also have offices in Paris. So our role, as Amelie said, is to help uh, the actors of the railway industry to develop their technologies and innovations. And so, yeah, the research activities are divided into three domains, which are human behaviors and railway safety, which I am part of. And there are also artificial intelligence and energy and assets management. And in fact, the um, research uh, follows a roadmap set by the CORIFER, which is the Council for the Strategic Orientation of the Railway Research and Innovation. And this roadmap deals with four major topics, which are the future of railway industry and infrastructure, inclusive mobility, zero carbon trains and smart trains. And so, of course, human factors play a role in each of these topics. So I'll now move on on the main subject of this presentation, which is integration of human factors in railway. I will talk about um, I will talk about automation. I will talk about technology and interface development, as well as user integration and system design. So here we have an AI generated picture, so generated with artificial intelligence, and it shows what could be the future of uh, the railway infrastructure, at least if we have a bit of imagination, of course. And uh, we can see that the human is put at the center of the picture and it will be the connecting point between the elements I will now focus on, which are which are rolling stocks, operational control center, and user integration. So the first element we'll have a, fo a, fo sorry, a focus on is rolling stocks. And so we'll be particularly interested in the main actor, which is concerned by the evolution of this system, which is the driver. So to give a bit of Oh, sorry. To give a bit of um, context, uh, today the railway industry, just like any industry today, uh, moved towards more automation. And we are talking about train automation, of course. And when we talk about autonomous train, uh, we are talking about grades of automation uh, that goes from grade one to grade four. So grade one, it's where all the monitoring and driving activities are entirely managed by the driver. And grade four, it's full automation. And so these driving and monitoring activities are managed by the autonomous system. And in between, uh, we have modes where uh, these driving and monitoring activities are shared by both the driver and, and the autonomous system. 
And so today in France, it's the driver uh, who is responsible for um, management of uh, monitoring and driving of the train. And so we are at grade one. And uh, today with the evolution, uh, with the evolution and development of autonomous train, so from grade two to grade four, um, and with the aim of increasing transport capacity, system safety and efficiency, uh, we are heading towards a redesign of the train driver's activities. And so in that matter, several challenges need to be addressed. And I will share with you four major challenges that I think are very important and interesting. So one of this challenge uh, is about how the driver uh, will manage mode transitions. So mode transitions, it's when uh, the autonomous system is switching from one level of automation to another. And so how to design uh, the interface, how to make driving activity evolve um, to make sure and to, to, to make sure that we can avoid some potential issues such as, for example, mod confusions. So mod confusions, it's, uh, for example, when the driver may be uh, because of a lack of situation awareness or things like that, it won't be able to tell in which mode uh, the autonomous system is. And if the autonomous system switches uh, in another mode, yeah, the, the driver won't be able basically to tell uh, into in which mode the system switched. And so, of course, the working procedures uh, will have to evolve as well as tasks. And so will as well the driving desk. So, which means that new elements might be added or removed uh, from the driving desk, especially taking into account how the activity is evolving, uh, of course. Um, the monitoring uh, of partially autonomous train uh, will be made remotely, which means that there will be uh, at least a deterioration or worse, a loss of uh, sensory perceptions that the driver uh, usually uses. And so a major challenge lies in how do we rebuild an adequate level of situation awareness uh, to address this love of sensory perceptions and to ensure uh, the traffic safety. And so it will be interface development that will play a, a huge part in supporting these evolutions especially with the development of, um, of advanced, well, the use of advanced technologies to convey information that the driving activity requires. Uh, for example, the speed of the train, uh, and it could be done with uh, other sensory modalities. So today, for example, uh, the, the speed of the train, the driver uh, managed to, to feel it, for example, to see it, of course, with the uh, um, the landscape uh, moving, but also feel it with vibrations. And so how uh, we can do that uh, when the driver is not in the train and it could be done, for example, I don't know, with lights, uh, for example, or with also kinesthetic uh, technologies. Um, with partially automated train, uh, the remote drivers uh, will be the remote driver's activity will be more about monitoring, uh, which means that the driver will be subject to loss of alertness. And so the monitoring of alertness will be a very important, very crucial. Uh, in France, for example, today, uh, the, sit the system that we have to monitor alertness, which is called VACMA, uh, and which is like, in fact, a pedal that the driver have to activate and deactivate every couple of seconds uh, to tell, yeah, to say, yeah, I'm conscious. Uh, well, this system today faces uh, several challenges. And for example, the driver's action on the system became more automated than conscious. And so, yeah, this system really needs to be redesigned. Uh, and if we want to talk about safety, and we all know that railway safety is, is really crucial, 
well, the human reliability will play a huge role in uh, helping um, in the safety demonstration of autonomous systems and autonomous trains in that matter. So you might all be familiar with uh, a principle that rules in the railway sector, which say that the modification of uh, an existing system must be managed so that um, the global resulting uh, safety level must be at least uh, equivalent to the one of the existing system. And so in France, uh, this principle is called the GAME principle. So GAME, it's globalement au moins équivalent. And uh, this principle is often associated with the ALARP uh, principle in England. So ALARP stands for as low as reasonably practicable. And in Germany, we have the MEM principle and MEM stands for uh, minimale endogène mortalitet. And so both of these principles are, are not exactly the same as the GAME one, but yeah, the idea is uh, when developing a system, we must uh, make sure that uh, the risk is minimal. And so, yeah, to demonstrate this GAME principle on driving related functions that will be transferred from the driver uh, to the autonomous system, uh, the human reliability uh, has to be assessed. So that was about uh, rolling stocks uh, and some challenges that the system face. Uh, and I will now move on another element uh, that we'll have a look at, which is the operational control center. So the operational control center uh, is where the supervision and management of traffic take place. Um, and so in the near future, what will happen is that we will have operators uh, making decisions on train switching and scheduling uh, on areas they won't have full knowledge of. And so we must ensure that they will build a good level of situation awareness. And so the idea is to develop uh, new tangible interfaces that will allow for the visualization uh, of the impact uh, of decisions uh, that the, the driver uh, will make and what is this impact on the traffic organization. And so the idea is that the driver won't actually uh, do an action on the technical system. It will be about simulation. And so, yeah, the operator will be able to simulate, in fact, uh, actions by, for example, moving trains on um, the interface. So, of course, not the real ones, but the digital ones. Uh, and they will be also able to navigate between distant geographical areas to see yeah, the impact, for example, of a train delay or if there is a modification in the direction of one train, they will be able to see in real time this impact, but without actually doing it, which is not possible uh, with the current system that we have to visualize train switching. And so these new interfaces will ensure that good and safe decisions are made uh, in complex situations. And that will result in an increased punctuality uh, and an increased transport capacity, of course. Uh, and we also have less static trains and less human errors. And the last point uh, that I will talk about here is about user integration. So user integration is here uh, modelized by um, this train station, because I think train station is maybe the most accurate interface between the railway system and railway users. And I think we can all picture today uh, today's train station crowded with travelers, and these travelers sometimes uh, will struggle to find information about directions, for example, directions in inside the station, um, information about their train departure platform or things like that. Uh, maybe there will also be running to catch their train because 
the bus that took them to the station was late. And because of all these potential situations, we really need to understand to understand the human behavior to improve, of course, train coaches' capacity, to reduce also dwelling time, or to optimize multimodal journeys. And these challenges could be addressed, for example, uh, by having uh, modular train coaches. So the train coaches, the layout of these train coaches uh, could be um, could be adapted in real time, depending on how many people are, are uh, taking this train, uh, maybe depending on what is the equipment of uh, the users taking the train. And of course, it could be also addressed by having purpose-made interfaces. So typically for multimodal journeys, there could be interfaces um, better made than the one that we have today, where uh, yeah, if if there's a delay in the in the multimodal journey of the user, which means that maybe the user is taking a train and after a bus, there's a delay on the on the train journey. The application could help uh, the user to find the better, the best solution for another bus to take or another uh, mean of transport for uh, their journey. And so to capture uh, this human behavior, uh, Raylenium is developing uh, an experiment center, so called Human Behavior Experiment Center. Uh, and this center uh, is using a scale one one modular testing platform, uh, which uses um, mixed reality as a main asset. And so today's um, the platform is used to develop safety systems uh, for railway user uh, on specific areas or of the railway environment. So it could be, for example, uh, by the rail tracks. So on the train station platforms, but could be also inside the, the train station hall. And um, and yeah, I won't be able to give too much details about the studies that are currently conducted on the platform, but um, I can give a bit more detail about the mixed reality system. So in fact, the virtual reality um, system is said to be adaptative, which means that any environment could be could be modeled using a virtual reality. And this virtual reality system would be coupled with uh, and is coupled because it's already the case uh, is coupled with um, purpose made physical elements uh, such as, for example, uh, yeah, the train station platforms, but also the rail tracks. And uh, yeah, the aim is really to make this platform multimodal, which means that uh, we want to to couple uh, the current uh, system that we are using, so the mixed reality one. We want to couple it, uh, if it's possible, and I think yeah, it is possible to couple it with um, uh, other measurement systems, such as, for example, uh, force plates. Uh, for biomechanical measurements uh, or markerless technologies to capture uh, the body movements and kinematics. But it, it could also be coupled with a driving desk or remote driving desk uh, to witness the interaction uh, with technical systems at level crossing, for example. And so, yeah, for, for Rellenium, this experiment center is really an opportunity to use all the levers uh, offered by virtual reality to incorporate knowledge of the human behavior in the development of safer and more efficient systems. And our ambition is to host experimentation in various domains. So, for example, it could be the training of operators uh, performing risky tasks. It could be for the evaluation and validation of industrial concepts. It could be for uh, the evaluation of some layouts, environment layouts for people with disabilities uh, or with reduced mobility. And it could also be, um, and we hope it could be used to host, for example, awareness campaigns 
on uh, railway risk and safety. And so, yeah, we we are really can't wait to see what we'll be able to to achieve with this experiment center. I put some picture uh, on this slide of the platform and on of the the virtual reality um, screen that we we have. So you can see that it's quite much detailed. Uh, and so, yeah, we can't wait to see what what. Uh, are the project that will be able to integrate uh, and so yeah we welcome any project so if you know if you know companies that are looking to in France at least I guess because it, it will be easier as it's based in France but any project that requires uh, the analysis of human behavior will be really um, honored like to host it in our experiment center so that's the end of uh, the presentation uh, about the integration of human factors uh, in the railway sector. And I will finish with this takeaway message uh, saying that in a world where automation plays an always greater part in system development, uh, human contribution has never been more relevant. So thank you everyone for your attention and yeah, I would welcome any question that you could have. Thank you very much, Jana, for this very interesting presentation. I'm checking the chat. Uh, yes, we have one question. Based on your experience, how can G OA4 automation handle degraded conditions in railway driving. Uh, can it be written on slide or? Uh, yes, it's. I don't know if you can see the chat. Yeah, I will. I will working on it. <laughs> just, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lutz. No worries. Thank you. Lutz. These three questions came uh, came uh, uh, nearly at the end of the presentation, so uh, I have to uh, prepare it. But uh, the first question is uh, already visible now, and I will format it. Yeah, that means based on your experience, uh, how can uh, rate of automation for automation handle degraded conditions in railway driving? Should I first answer the first question? question? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, or should I wait for you to write all the questions as you want? <laughs> so yeah, no, if I move on, the, yeah, if I move on the first question, so what is the primary interest of developing an experimental center? Well, using virtuality, virtual reality, sorry really enables us to reproduce real life situations with limited biases and and with a, a guarantee of uh, the user safety uh, indeed uh, today a lot of situations in playing human factors uh, can't be studied in details in the real environment and that is for several reasons uh, it is because the events studied can be uh, difficult to witness uh, due to the rarity of its occurrence. Uh, it can be also because uh, the situation that we want to study um, can put the user's life at risk. And uh, it is also because the, variable, the variables sorry, can't be fully controlled uh, as in a closed environment and controlled environment. And it's also because uh, the situation can't be reproduced in the exact same conditions uh, twice, like in the real environment. You can't have twice the same situation with the same conditions, but this is possible. Uh, all of these challenges can be addressed with virtual reality. And so with this experiment center, our will is to use virtual reality in an open area. So the platform is quite huge. And so this open area, uh, it enables us to ensure that the, immer that the immersion is sufficient uh, to have the users react the way they would in a real situation. So that's, that's really the interest of this experiment center. Uh, 
for the second question, based on your experience, how can GOA4 automation handle degraded conditions in railway driving? Uh, what I know is that uh, for a full autonomous train, it, there will be the, the possibility to retake the control and the monitoring of the train uh, from a distant desk. Uh, with an opera with an operator uh, being able to to get yeah, to take back the control of, of the train in a degraded in degraded degra degraded sorry <laughs> conditions in a railway and and yet yeah, that's about it uh, challenges whose responsibility to inform the user regarding the human factors uh, I think. Uh, it's a responsibility. It can be the responsibility of anyone. Of course, it's a responsibility of us human factors specialists. But I think it's also a lot about the responsibilities of the companies uh, that are working in the industry. But any companies, because human factors are everywhere, basically, <laughs> like they play a, a role in any activity in any domain. So, yeah, of course, the, the management. Uh, will have to inform um, to inform uh, their work about that and the company selling products or everything. Human factors should be integrated in their products and their information campaigns, maybe or things like that. But yeah, I think it's uh, something to deal with everyone. Whether it is uh, whether it is of the system manufacturer supplier company or the system user company? Is this question having something to deal with the one just above? Yeah, I think uh, these are more or less the challenges uh, uh, Astrid asked uh, uh, in, uh, in their presentation and we ask uh, uh, the audience to, to give the challenges uh, regarding human factors uh, uh, for the railway system. Uh, and uh, maybe these questions uh, should not be answered by you uh, uh, totally, uh, uh, but uh, give us an idea uh, what uh, is uh, the real topic uh, of dealing with human factors in the railway sector. Uh, and maybe Astrid, you can uh, comment uh, a bit on these challenges. Uh, is that what you 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 are expecting to to hear from the audience, or? <laughs> I didn't expect anything. I mean, or I I expected everything. So uh, that. Um, but but um, as Jana said, I think uh, it's it's more more related also to um, yeah to the first question because it's not yeah. Um, really a question whether it's the system manufacturer supplier company or the system user company um, well it depends who is developing for the customer right um, and sometimes it's it's good to cooperate uh, in order to make the customer um, basically to make the, the the user of the system happy so if it's passengers uh, for sure um, everybody in the system should try to make them happy um, and to integrate um, human factors as such um, so um, I think uh, um, also I liked how you put it Jana I think um, everybody is responsible for that in the chain of development um, so um, this um, this would be good um, and then it depends on who who is the user actually? Is it the passenger? Um, of course, the whole service chain. But um, if if the user is somebody within the company, it should be part of the change management and uh, of the information processes within the company. Basically, yeah. And the best way to inform the users uh, via document or training. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, the user should be informed as directly as possible. Training is really um, hands on stuff is, is better than to have to read a document. Um, and also they just they shouldn't just have to be uh, informed. They should be integrated in the whole uh, development process. Um, and um, their requirements should be taken into consideration as well. So their requirements regarding the procedure, for instance. Um, so um, to inform them as a last step 
of the whole development chain is not what you want to do. <laughs> you want to have participation. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Astrid. And yeah, regarding the last question, uh, regarding the model of vehicle interior, could you elaborate on how this would be achievable? Uh, we can't tell in detail because it's about uh, an upcoming project. Uh, but uh, yeah, we were thinking, of course, we can think, of course, about um, the the seat, the, the modulation of the, the the seat layout, or about the um, yeah. I will I will say seat because like I can't have in mind exactly uh, what. Um, uh, it will be about also like the, I don't know how to say that in English, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry, but um, uh, we we take in account, of course, uh, the, um, the, I don't have the word in English, but all the parts of the train, of the technical part of the train, because that will play a role, we, can't, we won't be able to do everything we want, uh, because of uh, uh, the system uh, of, that is included uh, in the trains, especially like the um, the wheel systems and everything. So that's it. I, I won't be able to tell much because it has not been addressed already. It's in an upcoming project. So I, I uh, operate lately decided to 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 uh, have a very last question because uh, I guess it is very interesting. And if you allow us to be uh, some minutes late uh, in this webinar now, how do you integrate users in the development process if you have thousand plus users? That's a really interesting question, and that has uh, that has exactly something to do with uh, the platform uh, I was talking about uh, um, just before. Because, for example, the the experiment center that we are developing, the platform will be able uh, to be up to one thousand nine hundred meters squared, and so we'll be able to uh, welcome a lot of users, like several hundreds, and so we will be really able to simulate, for example, if we are talking about the flow of users inside a train station, uh, it will be possible uh, to uh, simulate that with a lot of users on that platform. So this is our way, for example, to integrate that many users in the development process. All right, uh, thank you very much for uh, both presentations. We have a little program uh, still uh, to, to present you, uh, but it is not uh, quite long than, uh, than uh, before. Uh, first, uh, I will uh, uh, guess you, um, I will uh, drive your attention to our short uh, feedback questionnaire uh, that we are doing normally at the end of the uh, webinar in order uh, to learn uh, what is the quality of the presentations and uh, what is most important, uh, which topics you are interested uh, to be presented uh, in further webinars. Uh, and uh, maybe you are also interested to present yourself uh, in one of the next ESCI webinars, please let us know. So then I come to a very interesting topic that is called Innotrans. And uh, Innotrans uh, is uh, the world leading uh, 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 traffic technology fair uh, every two years in Berlin. It takes place from 24th to 27th of September. And uh, DTEC fair is also present at Innotrans at uh, various uh, uh, stands. And uh, uh, some of the ERCI members, plus uh, uh, the members, uh, are present uh, there. Um, yeah, one of the highlights of these uh, Innotrans, uh, of the ERCI highlights, is uh, the awarding ceremony of the ERCI Innovation Awards. It will take place uh, this year on Thursday, 26th of September uh, from 9 o'clock maybe some minutes later um, at uh, the Innotrans booth of uh, our cluster uh, CNA. It's located in Hall A in the City Cube uh, stand 240. And uh, another activity uh, is prepared uh, for the Innotrans and therefore I will give the floor shortly to Irina uh, to describe uh, this opportunity. Hello everybody, do you hear me? 
Yes. Okay, I will present shortly uh, the financial opportunity that uh, offers eBoost project, that is the electromobility for the recovery and internationalization of small companies. Um, the tech fair organizes this mission uh, during the Inotrans exhibition this year uh, uh, that will take place uh, from 24th till 27th of uh, September. So you can uh, move on, uh, Lutz, please. This uh, uh, mission uh, will be uh, 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 will cover only three days. So we organize um, a special agenda with accompanied and non-accompanied visits. Um, each uh, to, to this mission can apply any European uh, company uh, that is a small or medium-sized enterprise. Um, and also that is linked to uh, the electromobility sector. So if you uh, meet this criteria, please submit uh, to the link that you will receive. I will send it also here in the message uh, box. Um, uh, the, the financial support is uh, 1,500 euros. So uh, you have to fill in a very simple form uh, that will take about, about five, 10 minutes. Um, what else? Uh, the the uh, the location will be um, in uh, at the in the trans. So uh, the deadline for submission is the end of uh, June. Please uh, uh, be uh, as fast as possible because we we have uh, less than ten uh, free uh, places uh, in delegation. And just to 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 say a few words, uh, uh, what what kind of uh, agenda will be? We will uh, organize some uh, um, visits to outdoor display and bus di display. We will uh, invite you to to participate in conferences and forums that uh, organizes the, the trans organizers, and also you will be uh, part of the innovation uh, um, award uh, ceremony and a few cocktail networking meetings so please uh, submit if you're interested in case you have any questions you are free to contact me through the email you will receive you will see on the previous slide thank you Lutz. so uh, Irina thank you uh, for this contribution and uh, there is uh, another uh, uh, project where your name is on the slide. It's a success project. It will finish also uh, in a few days. And uh, uh, but uh, it is to support the European uh, SMEs of the race supply industry successfully applying to public procurements in USA, Canada, and Norway. The project ends, but let's stay in touch. If you are interested in uh, uh, one or two or all three of these countries, please contact ESCI uh, for USA, for Canada and for Norway. We have uh, special uh, contact uh, points. It's Irina, it's Amelie uh, and uh, Garazi from Mafex. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in this, uh, uh, please uh, do not hesitate uh, to get in contact with us. So uh, the STARS B2B matchmaking platform is uh, also a very interesting. We will use it uh, also for, 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 for a small uh, virtual interference uh, matchmaking opportunity, matching companies of the race supply industry with solution providers that support them in adopting advanced technologies to improve products, services, manufacturing processes and organization. That was the task of the STARS uh, uh, project and uh, if you want to get in touch with uh, other participants uh, of this platform uh, you can still arrange meeting with uh, other platform participants at any time uh, you can create uh, or update your profile uh, and in this information there is a short link uh, that shows you uh, how to proceed uh, with this b2b matchmaking platform uh, then uh, we have uh, here uh, the link uh, to the uh, uh, the direct link uh, to this uh, B2B matchmaking platform. So you uh, have anytime the opportunity to create.
profile and to get in contact with other participants of the platform. So you will um, uh, sh you will see uh, the recording of this webinar in, in a few days at this platform that is the YouTube platform of the Stars Project. And uh, now I will hand over to Guido Alcarani. He says something about the Leader 2030 project, which is the first uh, project coordinated by ESCI. Guido. Yes, thank you, Lutz. I will be very short because we are already out of time. But uh, nevertheless, I would like to say things, something about the Leader 20 project, which is learning for European. No, I need yes, learning for European autonomy to deliver Europe's rail in 2030. It's clear that research and development will deliver uh, possible uh, project to be then manufactured with new. Uh, product system or subsystem for the railway environment. And to do this, we have to be sure that we are not facing some disruptions. So next slide. Uh, just to indicate how much a railway system is complicated, let's start with the what is a, a, a pencil, uh, how, how many components in terms of raw material and activities are linked to a pencil. So we see that uh, materials, are, raw materials are coming from uh, several countries. Uh, you can already imagine the difficulties in putting all together. What about a railway system? Next slide. So uh, Europe's Rail uh, launched a, a, a call with some uh, keywords about uh, supply chain and need of the future, uh, constraint, risk of uh, disruptions, uh, resilience, and uh, things like that. Uh, ERCI with uh, some next slide. Sorry. So uh, ERCI was the winner of this call and uh, what we are trying to do, because it's a huge uh, effort, is to uh, face uh, all the difficulties, which are mainly geopolitical and uh, climate change that will occur in the next years, in order to be sure that we are able to deliver and allow the industry to manufacture uh, what is uh, uh, developed in the research, development and innovation project of Europe's Rail. In fact, uh, we have also to face some kind of competition because we are not, we of railway, we are not alone in the world. We have also other sectors using and aiming at uh, uh, incorporating the same kind of raw material. Uh, clearly, there is a, a choice that has to be done, not only from a political point of view, but also due to the lack of some of those raw material, also due to climate changes. All this is explaining a little bit what is behind this uh, Leader 2030. Next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, constructed a, a consortium which is led by ERCI but the ERCI is, at the end of the day, 18 cluster located on the territory, which is the best way to know what is happening and the contact with the small, medium enterprise, but also large enterprise, academia, and whoever. The second uh, participant is Relenium. Always Relenium, yes, they have a lot of competence, competency in, uh, on um, competence on, on the railway sector, able, being able to analyze which will be the, the bill of material of all the future system and analyzing uh, and putting in evidence which could be the shortage and the disruptions. Then we have JKZ from Saxony. Uh, it's a, it's a, his focus is on mining, mining. so we are on yeah. raw material. And then the fourth uh, participant partner is uh, Technopark Istanbul. Uh, we are using them in, in order to analyze which are the requests from similar sector from railways like aviation or other, which can give us some ideas 
on uh, priorities for uh, for our project or changes that we have to do in order to, to be able to manufacture those uh, innovation in the future. Next slide. What have we done up to now? Uh, finish, we have finished the study of the past because uh, unfortunately, but also thanks to those uh, difficulties, we have been able to know which are the difficulties and the potential disruptions uh, that we face in the in the past years, COVID, but also uh, canon, uh, Suez Canal uh, crisis or the war or whatever it is, as an impact on all our supply chain. Then now we are doing the analyze on, uh, we are analyzing the demand side, so trying to map uh, the, the, the future project and the existing uh, availability in terms of raw material and components. Next slide. Uh, yes, we have done a, a survey and thanks to the answer, we have been able to understand uh, something from the past, certainly which will be the basis for the for the future and also giving some ideas of what is missing at European level as a, a view from the railway sector of raw material, which are not in the top list of the Commission, but are top elements and raw materials for the railway environment. Next slide. Okay, uh, yes, I was saying that we are mapping the project and the needs. Next slide, please, Lutz. So if you want to follow this uh, Leader 2030 project, please use this uh, uh, in website address. Uh, there you will see the result that we are uh, gaining day by day and uh, your contribution are always welcome because uh, we we need all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Guido. Uh, the uh, website, the link is all the website link is already in the chat. And uh, uh, at last, uh, I will give you or we will give you uh, uh, yeah some opportunities where railway topics might be uh, included into future Horizon Europe uh, projects. There are three open calls uh, uh, which might be interesting also for the railway sector, uh, optimizing modern modal network and traffic management, uh, scaling up logistic innovations and improved transport infrastructure performance. And uh, these calls are still open. Uh, the deadline is the 5th of September. And uh, the deadline model is single stage. That means uh, uh, you uh, uh, should prepare the full uh, the full proposal uh, until the 5th of September. The difference of both uh, of these uh, presentations uh, of these uh, calls are uh, the funding model. Uh, the first one is a research and innovation action. That means 100% of the direct costs will be uh, 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 will be uh, funded. Uh, and uh, the second and third one are innovation actions. That means for companies, uh, up to 70% uh, of the direct costs will be funded for research institutions uh, up to 100%. So uh, if you uh, are interested in one of these topics, uh, please uh, keep us informed uh, because we are still uh, already uh, working in the background uh, to build up a suitable consortia for these uh, topics. And maybe your contribution is uh, interesting uh, to uh, insert it into uh, a consortium or you already uh, built a consortium and uh, you are looking for additional uh, expertise, uh, then please uh, keep us informed uh, also in that way uh, so uh, that we are able to uh, search uh, for uh, further suitable partners uh, for your consortium. So uh, another opportunity is especially for small medium-sized enterprises and for startups. Uh, that is a challenge uh, called by the TB Mindbox, and that is the uh, uh, accelerator uh, of Deutsche Bahn, uh, and it is on future of railroad construction industry. 
and uh, there are some keywords uh, uh, on this call. Uh, it's on work simplification in the construction industry, uh, green construction site and planning processes, uh, employer attractiveness, and innovative technologies for the construction industry and planning. And this call is uh, still open until the 14th of uh, July. And uh, the application could be done online, uh, must be done in English uh, because uh, the whole uh, 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 the whole uh, contest uh, uh, or the whole process will be managed in English. Uh, also the pitch sessions and uh, if you are win uh, one of three prizes, uh, you will win uh, 25,000 euros uh, on the one hand on on the other hand, a three monthly uh, mentoring program uh, to work together with experts from Deutsche Bahn. So the next ESCI webinar is not on Wednesday. That is the first surprise. It, it will be on Tuesday of the 16th of July. And it's not from 10 to 11.30 because we will have uh, American American uh, presenters uh, uh, which are sleeping at that time or <laughs> still are sleeping. Uh, so it is in the afternoon, uh, 15 to 16.30 Central European summer time. And it is on certification in North America and the registration link is uh, already open. It leads you to, uh, this time to the Real S uh, website, uh, but you find also uh, the uh, announcement of that webinar already on the ERCI website. And uh, yeah, expected topics for further ERCI webinars, you might uh, be free to suggest us uh, further interesting topics. And uh, these are only examples, uh, but uh, you will uh, find uh, your, your interesting topic and uh, please let us know. So uh, that is uh, the end of the webinar. We are uh, yeah, 18 minutes late. And uh, uh, please do not miss to fill in our questionnaire, feedback questionnaire, in order to tell us what was good, what was not so good, uh, and uh, what your suggestions for future topics, maybe you uh, or for future presentations, if you want to present uh, your innovations by yourself, uh, you are very welcome to do this uh, in one of the next ESCI webinars. But for today, uh, thank you for your uh, attention very, very much. And uh, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting webinar. Thank you to all of the presenters, not only the two main uh, presenters for sure, but also thank you to Elena and to Guido. Uh, thank you to the co-moderation by uh, Amelie. And thank you to Astrid and to Jana. And have a nice day and see you soon. Bye-bye. And to Lutz. Bye. -bye. Bye.